heaven. If you have a Bible, please join me in Exodus chapter 3 this morning. We are in a series entitled, We Are Overcomers. Uh, we come to Moses. Moses is one of the greatest rulers the world has ever known. But did you know that he had a big problem with insecurity? Now, the Bible calls Moses a man of God, a servant of God, a friend of God. But he didn't begin that way. All of those titles came to Moses after the age of 80. You see, Moses started out as a, as a Hebrew slave. He was raised by an Egyptian princess. He became a murderer and then a fugitive. But God was going to use everything in his past to prepare him for his role as the great deliverer of God's people. Moses went from a high and lofty position to a very lowly and forgotten man. Yes, the world forgot about Moses. He became a nobody for four long decades. How did that happen? In Exodus 2, Moses saw an Egyptian hitting a Jewish slave. When he came to his aid, he ended up killing the Egyptian, and in a panic, he buried him. He buried him in the sand, didn't do such a good job because he was found. And the news came to Pharaoh, who then commanded Moses to be put to death. Moses fled in fear. My message is entitled, Overcoming Insecurity. Overcoming insecurity. Here in Exodus 3, God commands Moses to go to Pharaoh and free two million Jews who are in horrible slavery. Would you please stand as I read Moses' five objections to God of why he can't do what God is commanding him to do. So this is literally a, a, an audible conversation between God and Moses. And I'm just going to read to you uh, Moses' statements, Moses' objections as he speaks to God. So let's pick it up here. Exodus chapter 3, verse 11. God, God gives the instruction, you're to go to Pharaoh. And what does Moses say? Exodus 3, verse 11. And Moses said unto God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Drop down to verse 13. Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What, what shall I say? What shall I say unto them? And turn a page over to chapter 4, verse 1. The third objection, chapter 4, verse 1. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. Chapter 4, verse 10. This is my favorite one, all right? Here we go, chapter 4, verse 10. And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. You can't use me. Chapter 4, verse 13. And he said, O oh my Lord, send, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. In other words, send somebody else. <laughs> Don't send me. Send somebody else. Well, there's a lot for us to learn here. Let's join together and, and ask God to help us to understand his word. Father, we come to you today, and we all have insecurities and fears and worries and we bring them to you today because we want to hear from heaven. We want to understand how you help Moses because in helping him, then you can help us. And Father, I pray today if there be one that, that knows not the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, Father, I'm asking that the Spirit of God would be sent from heaven to convict of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. Open their spiritual eyes 
that they might believe and receive and be saved today, whether they be here or watching online. And Father, help each of us as Christians now to be able to understand where the root of of insecurity and fear and worry comes from and help us to have victory. May we begin the journey on the road to victory today as overcomers. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. Have you ever been afraid of stepping out of your comfort zone? Have you ever made excuses for why you can't do something? Have you ever felt insecure and afraid? Well, Moses felt that way. And just like us, he struggled with insecurity and fear and failure. And when God asked him to lead his people out of slavery, Moses gave excuse after excuse of why he could not do that. So let's consider some of the sources of insecurity. Uh, Why? Why are we insecure? What are some of the common causes of insecurity? If you have your notes, you can follow along. Uh, First of all, is a legitimate fear for safety. There are legitimate fears of safety. There are certain places in big cities that I do not feel secure going. Uh, Most of us have seen security footage of innocent people being mugged or beaten or shot or run over because of random big city violence. And that's a legitimate fear for your safety. But then notice also, number two, exaggerated fears exaggerated fears. Both FDR and Winston Churchill were famous for saying, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Our own Penn State University has done some work on this, and they have discovered that 92% of what we worry about will never come to pass. 92% of what you're worrying about ain't going to happen. That means you're spending all that time at worry and only 8% uh, is the possibility of it coming to pass. Most of us locked our doors when we came to church today. Either you, you live that way, you don't lock your door, or you forgot to, but the rest of us, we, we locked our doors. How many here today, right now, you did not lock your door when you left home? Do we have anybody? I said... You did not lock your door. I only have one in the early service. Would you raise your hand? Wow. You didn't lock your doors when you came to church because you live in a safe place, right? No fear, no worry. But for the rest of us, you know that burglary is the most fear property crime. Yet it has gone down over the last 30 years. Now, why is that? Why do you think burglary has dropped statistically in the last 30 years? More security systems? But there's a bunch of you here. You just said, leave the door open. Come on in. (laughs) The most common time for burglary, do you know when that is? According to safewise.com, it's between noon and 4 p.m. That's the most common time for burglaries. And so you have little to worry about because it's before noon, all right? We're here before noon, so you're fine. Don't have to worry about that. But if you go out to lunch today, that's another story, all right? Uh, Then you're getting into the, the zone when it most commonly happens. That's just kidding. We live in one of the safest places in Pennsylvania, don't we? Oh, yeah, well, except, except when the prisoners escape. <laughs> Except when they escape and then, and then they steal a loaded rifle. Other than that, all right? Other than that, we live in a very uh, safe place. Common causes of insecurity. Number three, difficult childhood experiences. Uh, this could happen because of a, a parent who says things like, you'll never amount to anything. Or an embarrassing moment at school burned in your memory or an experience of failure, or a childhood abuse, physical, sexual, emotional, or neglect. Now on page two of your notes, one more common cause of insecurity, and this may be a surprise to some, insecurity brought on by perfectionism. Why do so many today struggle with perfectionism? 
Well, one reason is because of parents who have an unrealistic high expectation. I mean, a, a B plus is never a good for that parent. An A minus is never good enough for that parent. Years ago, I, many years ago, I counseled a, a new blended family. They were just regular attenders in the church. And where the new stepdad insisted that the boys, a preteen and a teen boy, hang their bath towels in their bathroom with the tag on the backside of the towel rack. Did you know the towels have a little tag on it? And so this stepdad, uh, tr trying to build a relationship with these kids, uh, insisted that the, the, the bath towel tag had to be on the back side. And when they came in for counseling, this is one of the things that they brought up. And I told him he was crazy. <laughs> now, I, now I'm, I'm a pastor, and so I said it in a nice way. I said it with a smile. I said, you're crazy. <laughs> uh, they didn't listen. They left the church. A year later, uh, they were divorced. A perfectionist, a stepdad who was a perfectionist, and he provoked his children to wrath. Perfectionism can be, well, it can be a coping mechanism to overcome childhood abuse. A child, here's one. Children who received excessive praise for achievements can become perfectionists. Why is that? They always want praise from others because that's how they were raised. That's what they are used to. And so be careful, parents. Give appropriate praise, not excessive inappropriate. Now, why was Moses insecure? Well, the same as the first three reasons that I've just listed above. Initially, uh, Moses had legitimate fears for his safety. Pharaoh put out a command, Exodus 2.15, I, I want him to be put to death. He was on the top wanted list, put him to death. That's a legitimate fear. But notice, secondly there, uh, exaggerated fears. Forty years passed. I can't go back to Egypt. Uh, I'm afraid. Moses, really, it's been 40 years. Don't you think that that old Pharaoh has already died? Exaggerated fears. And then number three, difficult childhood experiences. At some point, growing up, Moses found out he was adopted. At some point, he found out he was a Jew and not an Egyptian. And the Jews were despised slaves. That would make you question your identity. That would make you question your purpose in life. Hey, Moses, how did that work out when you tried to deliver your people 40 years ago? Ended up in failure, didn't it? And it's not just Moses. Then there's Elijah. Elijah was so distraught after the great victory on Mount Carmel and after the death threat by Jezebel that he fled to the south and under a juniper tree, there he prayed a suicidal prayer, O Lord, take away my life. O God, I want to die. God asks why. And he says, because I am not better than my father's. Mo, uh, Elijah, who said you had to be better than your fathers? Elijah, uh, he says, I'm not as good as my dad. I'm not as good as my grandpa. I'm a failure. Now, folks, if these two Old Testament heroes, Moses and Elijah, struggled with this, then I kind of think that we will too. And of the, of the millions of Old Testament saints, God chose two that, that Jesus would take to the Mount of Transfiguration to introduce to Peter, James, and John, the two that he chose had great struggles with insecurity. And so if God could help Moses and Elijah, then God can help me, and he can help you as well. Now there are survival responses that that, that uh, God has put into uh, our bodies uh, to, to when we are in these insecure circumstances. God made you in such a way that when you are in trouble, your mind and your body, involuntarily, they work extra hard to keep you alive. 
And so if you perceive a threat like, like an oncoming car, uh, like a, a growling dog, involuntary reflexes will respond in your body. There's a rapid breathing and heart rate. More oxygen is sent to your muscles and brain. There's tense muscles. Adrenaline is released in your body. Dilated pupils, better sight. You're better aware of your surroundings. We, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. God did that. God created you for your body to react that way, to protect you and to keep you safe. For church and school, we have gone the extra mile to alleviate feelings of insecurity when you are at worship or when the kids are in school. At church, uh, we have guardian angels, 36 monitored cameras, and more times than not, a police presence on the property in and outside the building. Hats off to Lou Lepore, uh, Kevin Goach uh, in the middle there who leads the Guardian Angel team, our maintenance staff, and then the whole team. And then at school, we are one of the most secure and best monitored schools in the state of Pennsylvania. Alex Johnson is our campus a safety monitor. And he is a foreboding presence. Kids love him. Criminals don't. <laughs> Alex has been through multiple security training levels. Now, both the Upper Providence Police and the Pennsylvania State Police have reviewed our security protocols. They've given the suggestions. They've, they've looked over the building and our protocols. Brother Freeman, our, our uh, uh, chief of police, has, has given insights and inputs on how we can best provide a secure place. On Friday, we had a lockdown drill observed by Dr. Beth Sanborn. Uh, she is the Montgomery County School Safety Coordinator for the entire county for all public and private schools. And she met with Lou and I, and she said, I'm very impressed with the safety measures you have in place. She said, I give you an A rating. She used words like spectacular and outstanding. And then she gave a list of 12 reasons how she came to that conclusion. Our students can feel safe at our academy. Now, what a contrast. Maybe you heard in the news this week, what a contrast to what some teen girls feel at Perkyoman Valley and Boyertown High Schools, where biological teen boys are allowed to use the restrooms, allowed to use the locker rooms, allowed to use the showers previously designated for girls only. They're not feeling so safe. A recent Gallup poll reveals that 69% of Americans say, quote, transgender athletes, that's, that's boys pretending to be girls, transgender athletes should only be allowed to compete on sports teams that conform to their birth gender. 69%. That's up from 61% in 2021. I mean, that climbed, that climbed in just two years, and that's good news. That means, that means only 30% of the country is still deceived on this topic. We're in the majority on this. Uh, we need to be able to speak the truth in love. Of course, they have the big mega microphone, but you need to understand that 70% of our country understands right and wrong in this topic. Now, Moses, he tried to do a good thing the wrong way, and he failed. And when he saw an injustice, he confronted it. But he did it in the flesh. He killed a man. He then feared for his life. He fled to the desert. Moses is afraid. Moses is insecure. Have you ever had a time like that? Confused, bewildered, numb, hurt because of, of loss. Maybe you've been through abuse or terrible pain in your past. Maybe you've done some things you regret. Maybe you've been through some hardships that have left you scarred and have left you scared. But you have come here today to hear the good news that God loves you and Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he died for you, he rose again, and his blood will not only wash away your sin, but also your guilt and also your shame and also your insecurity. God's grace can take every experience you have been through and he can turn it completely around and take every negative and make it into a positive. 
That's what he can do for you. And if you've been hurt by others, you are better prepared to help people. How? God says we comfort others with the same comfort that God has given to us, 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4. So there in your notes, you are not defined by what you've done. You are not defined by what has been done to you. You are defined by who you are in Jesus Christ. And that's good news. God was not done with Moses yet. He calls him to do a job, but he is so insecure. He has no confidence in himself. He has no confidence in God. He gives God five excuses, and each excuse reveals a little about what Moses believes about himself, a lie that he believes. And we are a lot like Moses, aren't we? We believe some lies about ourselves and about God, and God wants to change that today. So here we go. Moses' five excuses. First excuse, Exodus 3.11, who am I? Who am I? This excuse is based on our identity or self-image. What do you believe about yourself? Moses did not feel he was important enough for God to use him. Have you ever felt insignificant? Do you compare yourself to others and in doing so you come up short? So here's the lie. I am not important. I am not significant. I am a nobody. First excuse. Second excuse, letter B. What will I say? What will I say? Verse 13. This excuse is based on feelings of inadequacy. We feel unqualified to do what God asks us to do. We often give up before we even start. We become paralyzed with fear. Here's the lie. I am not qualified. Third excuse. Chapter 4, verse 1. Well, what if? What if they don't believe me? The excuse is based on fear. Anytime we're afraid of something, we start imagining the worst case scenario. We ask, what if we fail? What if others laugh at us? So here's the lie. I will mess things up. Fourth excuse, chapter 4, verse 10. I can't. I can't. I can't speak well. I stutter. I'm slow of speech. The excuse is based on insecurity. We defeat ourselves in our mind. We think we can't do something, so we don't even try. We assume we can't, so we won't. Uh, this is true in areas of sports as well. How many have said, well, I, I can't ski, and I, I can't golf, and I can't swim, and I, I can't witness, and I can't skate, and I can't whatever, but they've never tried, or they tried once or twice, and then they give up. The lie, I'm not able to do that, so I won't even try. Uh, parents of young children understand that where the kids say, well, I don't like that. But you've never tried it. Well, I don't like it. <laughs> but you don't know because you haven't tried it. You got to try it. Fifth excuse send someone else. Chapter 4, verse 13. We are so afraid of failing that we give up before we start. We literally sabotage what God wants us to do. We give up on God's ability to change us, God's ability to transform us, God's ability to give us His power and empower us. What's the lie? I can't change. I'm not like so and so. And all, of fi all five of Moses' excuses reveal something about himself. And every excuse that you and I make reveals something about ourselves too. What do we learn from Moses? Lessons for Moses' life. I want you to know that God didn't yell at Moses for being timid and being afraid. God understood the depth of Moses' pain and trauma. God listened to his excuses, and he responded. He's not going to let Moses stay stuck in his insecurity, and God is not going to let you stay stuck in your insecurity. God loves Moses, and he loves you. He loves me. He loves us too much to let us stay defeated. So what do we learn from Moses that can help us? Letter A, God wants to help us. Verse 12, God wants to help us. God says, I will be with you. I will help you. God wants to build his confidence. He says, I will teach you what to say. You are not alone. And so the message for us here is we need to learn God's promises. We need to memorize them. Memorize the reference and the verse 
and put it in our heart. Matthew 28, 20. I will never leave you. You're not alone. Uh, Matthew, or Isaiah 41, 10. I will help you. Philippians 4, 13. I will strengthen you. And when you memorize God's promise, and then you can say it. You say it to yourself, you can say it out loud, and you will find strength and help when these feelings come upon you. What can we learn from Moses? Letter B, just be yourself. Be yourself. Just like Moses, God is not asking us to be someone else. He made you. He knows your strengths. He knows your weaknesses. He is not surprised when we fail. And yet he has a purpose. He has a plan in mind for you and for me. Now, when I say be yourself, be a spirit-filled you, not a sinful you. Uh, not a critical and negative you. Not an angry you. Not a grumpy you. When I say be yourself, I'm not saying be like that. No, no. Be a spirit-filled you. Being you is not an excuse to lose your temper, to be negative, to be sinful, to be critical. That's UBC. That's you before Christ. Be a new person in Christ. Let her see. Uh, do it even if you are afraid. He tells him in verse 19 and 20, you just need to do this. Moses had to face his fears. He had to do it even though he was afraid. Everything God asked him to do was a challenge to step out in spite of his fears. Moses had to decide to follow God no matter what. He had to push forward until his fears subsided and no longer controlled him. What does God want you to do that you're afraid of? What does God want you to do that even though right now you're afraid to do it? Uh, get baptized? I can't do that. I mean, I'll get wet. <laughs> Don't you get wet when you take a shower? I can't do that. People will look at me. Uh, well, well, if you go out in public, people will look at you. Uh, you do it even though you're afraid. But I've never prayed in public. Do it anyway. I've never given a track out. Do it anyway. I've never shared my testimony. Do it anyway. If you decide today you're going to conquer insecurity, if you're going to get on the road, the journey that will, 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 will take care of those fears and worries and insecurity, then letter D, expect resistance. Expect resistance. Sometimes things do get worse before they get better. Some of Moses' fears came true. Didn't that happen? He, he didn't think Pharaoh would listen to him, and he was right, but that didn't stop him. He kept going back and back and back and, and doing what God told him to do. Do you know, especially in the early years, do you know how many thousands of times I would knock on a door and someone would answer the door and I would say, hi, and I have a track in my hand and I got one word out, hi, and they said, I'm Catholic, boom, and slammed the door. <laughs> again and again. And again, when you get resistance, what do you do? That's letter E. Try and then try again. Try and try again. Each time Moses went to Pharaoh and was rejected, he came back stronger and more resolved. And God used this conflict to build Moses' character. Conflict builds character. And as a prince, Moses was confident in his position in the palace. But as God's servant, Moses had a different kind of confidence. He had a confidence in God. He had a confidence in God's promises. He had a confidence, confidence in God's presence in his life. And you and I can have that too. A little fella, he picked up the nickname Sparky from his uncle. He didn't do so well in school. In fact, in fact, he, he failed eighth grade. In high school, he didn't do much better. He flunked, in high school, he flunked physics, Latin, <coughs> algebra, and English. He, he wasn't good in sports e either, but he did make the golf team. But he lost the most important match of the season. He even lost the consolation game. One thing Sparky loved was drawing. 
And so he offered his sketches to the high school yearbook, but they were rejected. He later submitted cartoons to, <coughs> to publications, to studios. He even sent it to Disney. He was turned down every single time. After serving in the army in World War II, he got his break. He began to tell his own story in a comic strip called Peanuts. Charlie Brown was the lovable loser and his adorable dog, Snoopy. Life magazine in the 1960s had the cover story, Charlie Brown and Snoopy, winners at last. Winners at last. After running continuously for 50 years, Peanuts became the most popular and most influential comic strip in history, appearing in more than 2,600 newspapers and in 75 countries in multiple languages. And because of Linus, we all know what a security blanket is. <laughs> Here's a picture of my collection. So I grew up uh, reading uh, Charlie Brown and Snoopy books, and so did my kids. I think I read more scripture verses from Linus in those books than I got from my own denominational church growing up. Uh, my family has supported my love of peanuts. Our first dog was named Snoopy. Now, if Charlie Brown could overcome his insecurities, if Charles Schultz could overcome his insecurities, if I can overcome my insecurities, then with God's help, you can overcome your insecurities too. With God's help. With God's help, we are overcomers. Would you say that with me? With God's help, we are overcomers. You don't need self-confidence. You need God confidence. You don't need a good self-image. You need to see yourself in Christ. You need to see yourself the way Christ sees you, the way Christ made you when you came to faith in him. So ask yourself, who am I in Christ? What is my identity in Christ? So there in your notes, would you say with me today, who am I in Christ? Let's all say it together. I am a child of God. I am holy and blameless. I am his beloved. I am chosen by God. I am alive in Christ. I am God's masterpiece. I am his special treasure. I am secure in Christ. I am no longer a slave to fear. I am a friend of God. I am free. I am redeemed. I am victorious. I am seated with Christ. I am a citizen of heaven. I am salt and light. I am an ambassador for Christ. I am sealed by the Holy Spirit. I am secure in Christ. I am an overcomer. I'm an overcomer. And you are too, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. Without Christ, without Christ, you're a loser. We need to come to Christ to believe, to trust. It's the gift of God. It is the ultimate gift, and God offers it to you today. Receive it by faith. May we pray. Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for Moses through his trials, we see victory. He overcame the insecurity. He overcame the fear. He overcame the worry. And you made him a friend of God, servant of God, a leader. And I pray that we might be able to see what you have for each one of us from that first step of obedience and baptism to learning how to share our faith to putting sin off and living in righteousness, walking in truth. God, help us now to take the first step on the journey of victory, overcoming insecurity and worry and fear. Today, I want to ask you, was there a day in your life that you gave your life to Christ 
You trusted Christ and Christ alone. Not, not faith in sacraments, not, not faith in sincerity, not faith in good works, but Christ alone. Do you remember that time where you realized you couldn't go to heaven with your sin and you asked Jesus Christ to become your Lord and Savior? If you had that testimony today, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed as we show respect to our neighbor, but you'd say, I'm a Christian. I've been born again. I remember the time that I gave my life to Christ. Would you raise your hand all over our congregation today? God bless you. You may put your hands down. You say, Pastor, I, I, I wasn't able to raise my hand. But I believe the Bible. I believe Jesus is God's son. I believe that he is the Savior. And today I want to transfer that faith from my head to my heart. I want to trust Christ alone. I want to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And if you sense the conviction of the Spirit of God upon your heart and you want to be saved today, you want to give your life to Christ today, I'd like to lead you in that salvation prayer. Saying that prayer won't save you, believing and trusting and committing your life to Christ will bring salvation to your heart. Can you think of one reason why you wouldn't want to accept that gift today? As God touches your heart, whether you're here in this worship center or watching online at home, won't you say yes to Christ today and be born again into his family? Pray with me now from your heart. God will hear the prayer of your heart. He, he heard Hannah's prayer. Her, her lips moved, uh, but no voice came out. But God heard that prayer and gave her a son. God will bring salvation to you. Would you pray with me right now? Dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he died for me and rose again. Please come into my heart and become my Lord and Savior today. I trust Christ and Christ alone. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. If you just prayed to receive Christ today, may I say to you, welcome to the family of God. And I want to pray for you now. I want to pray that you will experience the same joy and assurance many of us have. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. I want to pray that you have that experience today. That peace, that assurance. Would you simply raise your hand? Anyone at all, Pastor, I pray with you to receive Christ as my Savior. Just hold your hand up high for a moment. I want to see it. I want to pray for you. Anyone at all, just hold your hand up high for a moment. Anyone, you say, Pastor, I pray with you from my heart, and I meant it. During this invitation, prayer, and song, are you ready? and willing to give your fears, your anxiety, your insecurity, Our and to God give it to Christ. And to take on us His peace, His power, His strength his to do what He's asked you to do for His glory. This promise is we will never walk alone. Our God will go before us. The Lord of hosts is with us. Oh, praise the one who leads us on. For his grace will bring us home. Father, thank you that you do go before us. Thank you that you never leave us or forsake us. Build our faith. Make us strong with courage as we share your love and truth with others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.